Hello and welcome back to the What The Fork podcast in association with Viper Goalkeeping. We have an absolutely tremendous guest for you today as part of another Sunderland special. One of my favourite strikers throughout my 34 years of supporting the club. He played for Sunderland between the years of 2007 and 2010, scoring almost 40 goals for the club. And I will address him by his full name. Welcome to the show, Super Kenwin Jones. How are you doing? Are you well? Yeah, I'm well. Thank you very much. I haven't heard that for a long time. It replays in my head quite a bit. It was one of my favourite tunes, so it replays in my head a little. I don't know. I think um, uh, I've been lucky enough, you know, for every um, club that I played at, you know, I would have a song, which is, which is, you know, is a testament to how much the, the fans, um, you know, take to you. So I'm very appreciative of that. I think it's always a good start when you have a song, and I think you got that one pretty quick. Um, before we... Yeah, it was it was unreal how quick that happened, though. <laughs> but, I mean, like I say, I, I, I like it. Not everyone gets a song, so... <laughs> Just to double-check, Kenwin, are you joining us from Trinidad at the moment? Are you back in Trinidad currently? I've been back in Trinidad for the last couple of years um, after I retired. Um, it's, it's, it's home, you know, um, the sun is shining all the time, it's hot, so I, that's where I prefer to be. Um, I live in Scotland and there's snow outside at the moment, so I'm not jealous at all. I like you. <laughs> I have many fond memories of the snow and, and, and playing in it, training in it, you know, it's a, it, was a big, it was a big obstacle for me, I think, you know, coming from where I come from and, and trying to, to maneuver through that, you know, the weather, was, it was brick. Northeast, it, it's brick. So you have to be tough to, to come through something like that. And thankfully, I did. Yeah, yeah. I think I think there's a few Trinidadian players at the same time. And obviously, I've spoke to Carlos before. He struggled with the weather a little bit. But you managed it. You coped with it. You got over it. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was one of those that, you know, was pretty painful for myself. Because, like I said, it's, it, it's not the, the, the point of feeling cold, you know, um, um, where the weather was concerned, I had other um, physical problems with it, but I had to, I had to mask it in order to to, to get the job done. Um, so, it's it's something that I, I played with, you know, throughout my career entirely, but you know, particularly at that time, I think it was just, you know, the location. I mean, I I came from Southampton, which the weather wasn't that bad, to you know the extreme. Of, of the northeast and i mean at the end of the day it, it is football you try to get on with it and all the remedies i would have tried to you know to be able to cope with it i had to do that at home you know um of course that meant you know um regulating my body to after after training and matches you know before i actually had a shower um and and basically pain in my feet um because of the weather, but it's something that I had to, to endure in order to play the sport. I think you certainly did, hence the, the level of questions I've got for you today. But before we go into your career at Sunderland, um, obviously you're back home to Trinidad at the moment. I believe that you're currently director of a new business, a new venture called Black Diamond Sport. Uh, what does it entail and, and how can people find that online? Well, um, you can definitely find it online at blackdiamondsportsinternational.com. Um, that's BDS Sports um, International at no int dot com. Um, it's a it's a it's a beautiful brand new company. I would I would say um, that is involved in in club acquisitions. Um, we form a lot of partnerships with a lot of brands to be able to 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 to, to help people properly. Um, what I've learned over my career um, is that. You know, there tend to be a lot of, 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 of not so, so truthful people. Um, but I've aligned myself with um, a former Middlesbrough player uh, <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a few others in order to form this wonderful partnership. Um, it's also a, a player agency as well. Um, so it's a bit of business all around that we try to do to, to, to make a, at least a cleaner outfit in the, in the business world. Amazing. Always good news to do that. Um, now, you touched on it before. You came from Southampton, so we'll go back to 2007, which feels like yesterday, but it's not, Ken, when I, I'm sorry. Um, it's not, is it? <laughs> 14 years ago, that's a long time. Scary. Um, 
I think we paid six million plus Stern John of all people for you. Um, yeah. If I remember correctly, Southampton were in the championship. We just got promoted. But um, why did it feel like the right time to leave Southampton and come to Sunderland at that point? Um, I just spent three years at, at, at Southampton um, and obviously kicking on doing pretty well. And, you know, transfer window came around. Um, Southampton as a club, they were a selling club, you know, um, well, for a long period of time. And, um, you know, Sunderland came up. Sunderland and Derby at the time came up. I didn't really fancy um, Derby, to be honest with you. And, and most of my career, I've always played in stripe, red and white stripes as well, too. And to help the fact, um, you know, I had a few compatriots at the club, which is always an enticing factor because it's, I mean, me being in a unknown territory, um, having countrymen, and not only countrymen, but friends of mine at, at the club um, was a big factor. And probably the biggest factor is, you know, um, hearing from Roy Keane at the right time um, about coming to the club and what he wanted to do. It was a new project. I think um, the year before Southampton, we, we played Sunderland in the championship the year before. I think we got beat 1-0 or something like that. 2-1. Uh, or 2-1, sorry. That's, that's to tell you how long ago it was. It was an amazing sight for me when I um, played that game at that stadium. You know, um, it's, it's, Sunderland has a wonderful stadium. Um, state of the art, I think, and and it was you know an eye opener for me playing in a stadium such as that. And then you know, funny enough, the the next season came around and, and they came in for me, and I and I just thought, you know what, um, my career is is going to be an experience because again, I'm not from the UK, so you know I want my career to be filled with 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 a lot of experiences that I can look back on. And at the time that it happened, I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't know. I can't tell the future because, you know, football careers are very short. You're not guaranteed to, to be at the top. You're not guaranteed to experience um, premiership football. So I was like, you know what? I think it's, it's possibly the right time to, to, to make a change, um, step up a level, learn something new, and see how, how best I can test myself talked before about um, having people you know who you knew, who were friends, who you'd played with before, and, and like you say, were close friends in fact, um, Carlos Edwards and, and Dwight York, and I believe Stern John was there at the time as well, even though he was going in the opposite direction. What is it they said about the club, and, and how did they sell that to you, or did they, did they not really have to? Well, to be honest with you, they didn't have to. You know, uh, just the law of, 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 of playing in the premiership was enough. Um, and of course, you know, them being there, it's, it, it wasn't a case of, you know, they have to sell me about the club or the fan base and what they're like and what they're trying to achieve and that type of stuff. You know, I had my own um, ambitions, I would say, and having friends there and, of course, them being in the premiership was, was something that, that, that attracted me personally. I mean, when I went up there and saw the training ground and the, and the, and the chairman and, and the manager and stuff, of course, that solidified it, but for me, the overall experience was just about coming there, playing in the club. Talking about that period in Sunderland's history, looking back, I would like to say I've got a, a decent grasp on what is a good time and a bad time in Sunderland these days, and um, I think we didn't quite realise how good that was, and a lot of it stemmed from from Roy Keane, and one thing I really loved about Roy Keane was he seemed to bring up the standards of the club. Um, did it feel an exciting time to be part of Sunderland when you first came? Of course, of course, it, it did feel like that. And, and to be honest with you, um, uh, uh, he, he is a, a, a big factor for that. I mean, apart from the club, I mean, for the team, you know, a lot of people had different experiences as, as, as players do with, 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 with managers. Um, but I found it to be really a, a big learning experience and really a really good experience for myself. Um, to be honest with you, I, I'm, I am of the opinion that, you know, at the time, um, he was he was fresh into management. Um, I honestly think to this day that if he gets the, the, the proper backroom staff behind him, 
you know, a mixture of, 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 of good experience, um, coaches and, 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 and that type of thing, he, he will do well. Um, I had no issues with him at all while I was at the club. Unfortunately, you know, for clubs that are just coming up from, from, from the lower division into the premiership, is, it is difficult to, to be able to be a pulling factor for um, top, top, top quality players and getting that blend right in order to, to maintain your position in the league is, is, is pretty tough. So it was a learning experience for all of us, but I think that a lot of good things came from that period as well. Yeah, tons, so many, uh, compared to now especially. Um, one thing I, I find quite intriguing about yourself and, and Roy Keane is, I think from the outset, and I don't know you for this past 10 minutes, and I've never met Roy Keane, but from the outset, it seems like a very different mix of personalities. You seem very chilled out, relaxed. He seems very almost uptight. He has standards and he's always anxious and verging on blowing his top. But I would say... To be honest with you, I think that's a mis conception of you or of him of, of of him i mean me i'm i'm pretty as they would say laid back um at the end of the day work is work and life is life you know you can't get fussed about anything because no matter what you do the these situations will exist so i i, I don't bother to waste a lot of of, of of wrong emotion in in situations you know but i i think it's 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 obviously a, a misconception because of how he was as a player. He's not a person that has many friends. Um, it seems as if he's meant to be the Grinch of football, you know. But um, to be honest with you, I think you know when he's on his business playing football or managing or whatever, you know, it's it's a serious time. He takes it that seriously. Because football, uh, as with a lot of us, that is the, 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 the profession that gave us everything in life or at least a foundation in life properly so that we can build off of. But in, in between, in his quiet times, I think he is misunderstood a lot. You know, people go on the perception of being in the football arena and what might come off from that. But I think he's misunderstood a lot. He's, I think he's quite cool. A lot of the things that he might say it might be unfiltered, but, you know, it's reality. It is what it is at the end of the day in order to, to, to be at the top for as long as he was and, and, and play at the clubs that he played at and win the, 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 the trophies that he's done. You have to adopt a certain, you know, personality. You have to have a certain fight, a, a certain streak of aggression. Um, and that, that is, that is, that is what he knows. That is where he came from, you know, in order to make it there, he came from, from, from Cork. And by all explanation, it's not, it's not an easy place to come from and make it. So I think people have to give a little bit of, of leeway where that is concerned. Um, but overall, I do think that he's a cool, chill person, especially after his playing career, you know, being on the, managerial side of things as you get older you get to understand more about life and situations and whatever and he, he was pretty cool like i said i didn't have you know i didn't have any problems with him i didn't i never had a falling out with him never had an argument with him that type of thing i mean he would and i think that's what works so well he would try and you know at certain games especially especially when i um after my um my knee injury, you know, just coming back. I didn't feel like myself, you know, for probably a year after, you know, in 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 my body and, and mind and everything. But I came back playing after six months. And, you know, to get us going, obviously, um, some of the games we were losing, things wasn't, you know, the way that it should be. But I remember um I think my first proper game that I started was at Blackburn in 2008 or 2009, that was. And halftime we came in, um, we were one nil down, I think. And, you know, it wasn't looking too good. We couldn't get it right. And, and Blackburn, for some reason, was extreme. It was like bone chilling cold that night as well. And, 
we came in and you know he was having a go at people around the room and he tried to have well he 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 did what he normally does you know you know try to have a go so that might play in your head and you will go out and 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 you know perform you know or raise your standard i would say cuz it's not like we were playing badly but we just couldn't click and get it together and you know had half time he said some stuff I didn't really take it on because I'm not accustomed to, you know, taking on the th- some of the things that he would say, not related to football, but some of the things that he would say too seriously. I, I, I honestly found it amusing and amusing to the point where a lot of the, the guys in the dressing room, they would take a lot of the stuff that he said personal. You know, I'm, I'm not that type of guy. I'm the type of guy, the only way you can get personal with me is in my personal space. You know, if, if you want to get to that level. But apart from that, whatever people say is, is not going to bother me. So, I mean, we went back out. Um, I scored. Cissé scored as well. We won the game 2-1. And after the game, you know, everyone was happy. And I could just remember him sitting on one of the benches in the locker room and just having a little a little smirk at me thinking, ah, yeah, he put his socks off. I could, oh, yeah, that actually worked. And I had a smirk as well. Because I found I found that exchange like really, really, really funny, you know. And those are some of the things that 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 changed my perception, or or didn't give me the the same perception as people, you know. At training, he would get involved in training, um, especially when we would be playing, you know, um, whole field games and that type of stuff. And a lot of times, he would be on my team. And he would pass me the ball. I would go, I'll have a shot, I'd score. He would say, oh, my goodness, you're so lucky you scored that. Because if you didn't, I'd be ripping your head off to pass me back the ball. And I would laugh because at the end of the day, I mean, you're, you're the manager. You had your time. You're not playing anymore. So you give me the ball there, I'm going to try and score. Because on the day of the game, you know, <laughs> you're not going to be playing. I'm playing. But I used to find that exchange and, you know, it had... Quite a few times we would just be at training and, and talk about random stuff, you know. And, and like I say, a lot of people have a, a different perception of him because maybe they didn't have that relationship. Or, you know, sometimes, and I'm not saying that he is, but sometimes, you know, in, in social groups, when you find someone who is a bit weak mentally and you have a jokester in the, room, in, in, in the group, he's going to kind of sense that and take advantage that type of way. I don't think that he felt that for me. So it was good that he could be on, you know, a level playing field. That, that's my perception. He probably could tell you something different. But at the end of the day, for me, it, 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 it was a very good relationship, I would think. I was very sad to see him, you know, get the sack. Obviously, like I say, it's very hard for teams when they come up from the league to to build a squad strong enough to be able to stay in the league and 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 do well. But, you know, I, I always said that that even to this day, if he gets the right mix of uh, backroom staff, you know, he will do pretty well in management. Yeah, we, we absolutely love him here. And I think the kind of question I was, I was going to ask in relation to Roy and yourself was, I think it was quite clear from the outset that he absolutely loved you. Um, Obviously, there's the famous comment about he wouldn't sell you for for 40 million, which doesn't seem like much these days. But at the time, that was like huge money. At the time, time, I honestly don't think that is true because you know what the football business is like. But at the same time, I was I mean, I didn't even I didn't I honestly did not even buy into that statement. You know, um, he was responding to whoever, but I wouldn't even buy into that statement because it's not the thing that I. It's not the thing that I depended on in order to validate the type of relationship we had. Um, like I say, you would get it every day, the training, whether you do good, whether you do bad. You know, those type of exchanges every day is what is going to determine what your relationship would be. So, you know, having special comments in, 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 in articles or, or interviews or whatever like, like that, it didn't really, you know, have me feeling like, oh my God, yeah, he loves me so much, type of thing. As a professional then, maybe from in a different way, not your own manager, 
there was a comment from from John Terry that came out and he, he said you were the most, I mean, no one at Sunderland was surprised to hear it, but it became quite famous outside because maybe Sunderland weren't seen as fashionable as the top four. But John Terry said you were his toughest opponent. Do you take that sort of thing on board or does that not affect you either? Um, To be, it, it, it is a bit of validation, yes. Um, I mean, for every time that I played against John Terry, it was it was always a battle. And, and I mean, the team would not get the best of him, but I would always get the best of him. You know, I was probably his his biggest test as a player um, during his career, you know, um, because for clubs such as, as as Chelsea, who are bigger clubs, they they come with a with a with an aura of winning. You know, sometimes they, they, they turn up and they've won already. And, you know, it was always a good battle between him and myself. And especially, and it would come, I think it would come in moments that he would have been, you know, under pressure a little bit, you know, with, uh, with Chelsea. And, you know, they might not have a couple of the results or not performances and he might not be playing. And then when he gets the opportunity to play, you know, he's coming up against me and it's not, it's, it's, it's not his best afternoon. So, but I do, I do respect that comment from him. Um, honestly, I just tried to, to give, you know, the best of me. Um, but we're all human, you know, we all have faults, we all have chinks in our armor. So I guess I was probably his chink. When it comes to, I think we spoke a little bit off sort of off air and at the beginning of the podcast about the fact that you almost instantly had a good relationship with Sunderland fans. You had a song pretty much instantly. Now, I remember your debut. Um, also, Danny Higginbotham's debut, uh, coincidentally, who you played with at Southampton as well. Um, I remember because I sat in the corner where you first did the backflip, um, which I always worried about when you did it. I was always like, don't injure yourself. Um, but how good was that as a debut? It felt like it was everything you could have dreamt it could have been. Um, did it feel like that for you? Well, yeah. Um, to be honest, when you go somewhere new, you want to be able to make an instant impact. You know, um, not to, not foremostly to, to, to endear the fans to you, but your first thing is you want to be able to settle in your team, you know, prove to your teammates that you can handle the job. Because obviously, when you come in as a new player, you have varying um, perceptions. It's either someone is coming in to take someone's spot, or this person is coming in to help. So you're hoping that person, you know, gets off to a really good start. And you know, it 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 just flowed at that moment. Um, obviously, having the assist and then the goal, um, winning the game is something that you could not ask for. Really, um, I mean, you could dream it up a couple of ways. Uh, some people might dream they just want to score six goals or a hat trick or something, and you win the game and you end up winning the match, blah blah blah. But in reality, with the sport, not everything goes your way, and I was just thankful that it did. Firstly, um, when the way it went, because then that made me settle a lot quicker within the team, and of course, being in there to the fans is is, is also. A treat with Sunderland and I think it's sometimes something that we know ourselves but we hear it a lot from outside um people come to the club knowing how big of a club it is I think I, I'd like to think we're, we're a big club but then when people get inside of it they kind of go oh god it's it's absolutely huge like this is like life or death sometimes did you feel that um it's it's I think people underestimate the size of the club to be honest um, I also think that, you know, with the business that has gone on in the past years, that in itself hasn't been treated well. Um, because the perception for a lot of people is, you know, that in, 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 in the Northeast, there's only one club because obviously um, Newcastle Stadium's capacity is a bit bigger. They have possibly the more the more the more swan song of a of a history when it comes to a certain type of players you know they've attracted to the club and Sunderland have been on the other side of that where yes they've had some 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 champagne players at times and has has a good history as well but you know people see it as oh well that's the other side of Newcastle and that's not really that good 
And then when you do come to the club, you see the fan base and you see the stadium, you see the training ground especially. Um, it's something that blows your mind. I can remember um, at that time, the only two places or the other two places I know that had a training ground to, to, to that magnitude or to that standard as Sunderland did, in my opinion, was um, Glasgow Rangers, because I've been there, and Manchester United. Apart from that, I didn't think anyone else, you know, was at that level. And I, it was pretty surprising to me when I pulled up at the training ground and saw the outlay of it. I mean, the only thing that is needed around someone's training ground is a, 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 probably a forest that it could block the wind out. But <laughs> apart from that, Apart from that, it is an amazing training ground. Um, the, the facilities are just fantastic. So I think you have to be able to be within that club to actually appreciate the, the type of club it is and, and the standard that, that is there. With that first season, um, I asked people on, on Twitter last night, I posted a photo of you and I said, you know, what is your uh, memories of Kenwin Jones? And I would say, from about 100 plus replies, about 75 of them were the words unplayable. Um, and I think that's how I remember, especially the first season, especially before the injury. The, when you first came, I was like, where's this guy come from? Why did that first season go so well for you? I don't know. I, I just think that, that, that at that time, I was on the ascendancy of, you know, of being young in football. I mean, the injury that I got it was something new to me. Um, and it took me some time to actually, like I say, center myself and, and, and feel like myself again, because I always felt like I had a deficiency. You know, I'd always measure myself up. Like before my injury, I think I was so quick. And then after that injury, you know, I had to, I had to be really cognizant, especially when you have an injury like that and you get advice and they say, well, you know, you're always susceptible to getting that injury again. It's something that, that, that played on my mind a lot because, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm young and I want to be able to have a, a decent enough career. So it, 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 it used to play on my mind a lot. So, you know, I could say a lot of ifs if I didn't get that injury. And then, you know, within the club itself, some of the things that kind of upset the, 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 the operations, I would say, of teams and, 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 and players. I mean, I know it's the business of football, but a lot of the situations that how they treated with the players and the business of it wasn't too well, you know? So for a lot of people, I think, um, you know, it rubbed them the wrong way, but, you know, that's, that's, that's life. Of course, yeah, and, and sometimes there's football, unfortunately, but nonetheless, never nice to hear was there. As a Sunderland fan, now I did want to touch on the injury, even though we've sort of spoke about it already. I remember watching it um, at my my first ever girlfriend's house, funnily enough, um, and I watched it because it was England. I watched it because you were playing. I think Carlos was playing. I think Dwight York was playing. So it was of interest. And then you think, whatever you do, just don't in injure Kenwin Jones. And then lo and behold, early in the game, yeah. there goes your your ligament. Um, so after such a positive season, where I think it would be remiss of me not to say you were our key player at that point. You get a big injury that we know is going to keep you out for a while, but how did you feel? Because it's the first time it happened. Well, to be brutally honest, I, I was, I had some serious interest from Liverpool and the way how things were looking, I was on the verge of literally going to Liverpool at the, when, once the transfer window opened in July. Mind you, we played this game on the, the 8th of June, I think, that year. So it, it was a big blow to me because I got injured at that time. You know, as a player, when you, when you, when you measure yourself and your progression, I guess having interest from these type of clubs is something that, you know, would obviously give you a good barometer of where you're at or where your potential can be. And for me at that time, it was like, oh my goodness, uh, I'm getting this interest. It, it is very likely I'm going to move and then 
injury. You know, um, I think um, in my life I could count on my both hands how many time I cried, and 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 that 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 is one time that I really really cried. Not because I got injured. Yes, I got injured. I was in a lot of pain, but at the same time, no one was what was about to come next. Of course, and I think you'd had that good of a season as much as it would have killed us and it kills me to hear that you might have left I think we can all probably understand if we're realistic you know same with Jordan Henderson when that move came along sometimes there there is some clubs that can win more trophies than some and then we have to unfortunately accept that well funny enough in that season when Jordan left for Liverpool I was supposed to go six months prior I was supposed to leave in the January window and to be honest, it that again was another big blow for me because everything was agreed for me to go. Um, I think the the sum was like they were gonna pay a loan fee of a million pounds at in January, and then come the transfer window they would they were gonna pay um, a further fifty million pounds at that time, you know, and everything was agreed, and I had one training session where I fell out with. With, with, with Steve Bruce <laughs> and that basically shut everything down you know that that was a devastating blow for me because I was going through a little rough patch off the field and you know I was thinking yeah at that time a move would be good because I'll be in a new environment I'll be able to clear my head and just play football and that type of stuff and then you know from the from that time Steve Bruce came in he disrupted I think the dressing room um, from the beginning of the season, really. And I can remember having a battle within myself leading up to the winter transfer window that I don't want to be in a place like this, not, not, you know, not be at a club like Sunderland, but be in an environment where you have to fight to be okay within a team. Um, not fight for your place because we all know that's part of the job. But from the moment he came in, he separated the team into the players that he brought along and to the players that were there pre- from the previous management. You know, and we got rid of a few people quite quickly. And even in our training sessions and meetings, that type of stuff, you know, he would do things that would basically separate the squad. And it was pretty tough. To, to, to function in a squad like that. That move came along. It, you know, I was I was buzzing because I'd have been in a new environment, not necessarily leave leaving Sunderland, because I do still think, you know, Sunderland is one of my, my or if not the best time I've had, you know, over my career. It was one of the best times I had. With that situation, I'm probably jumping too far forward, but we can always come back. It's fine whilst we're on the subject of it. Um, I remember the situation with Steve Bruce. Um, I remember lots of situations with Steve Bruce and obviously I've had conversations with Carlos which is one of the players that immediately got sort of bombed out and I won't speak for Mm -hmm. Carlos but I know they don't get along so well or didn't Um, I remember specifically towards the end of that season when you you did leave um, which I'm going way too far ahead here but we'll we'll come back Um, you'd had a really good season with Darren Bent came to the end of the season and then I remember he played you at centre back in pre-season, and it felt not like he'd seen you as a centre back. Well, yeah, it no, felt well, like an insult. Me, that that situation with in in pre-season, I mean, our 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 players was dropping like flies, our defenders, and I was like, well, we're playing, we're playing Benfica um, right. against David Luiz and them, and it's like you know what, we need numbers to actually fill a squad to put out. We were out of defenders, and I was like, I have, I have no problem. At that point, I'm like, you know what? I'll play there. It's, it's not a problem for me. I've played there before. I know how to play the position, and we need we need the body. So it wasn't a big thing for me, you know, at that point. Um, like I say, you have different experiences with, with, with managers. Any player will tell you that. You know, you have people that are doing punditry now on, 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 on the television, and they sort of have, uh, a, a very one-sided view of how football is and being in a club because they've won trophy, a lot of trophies and their career turned out smashing, you know. Um, not all players have that. 
and the same experience, even within those big clubs, um, that one player could give you, another player could give you a totally different side of the story. And that's not the story that you tend to hear too much. Um, that, that sort of gets stifled because everyone believes that, you know, once you're in, in the building, everything should be honky-dory, you know? Um, but quite, like I said, a, a lot of people didn't have a good relationship with him. Um, in that squad, he separated his team and even a couple of people that he did um, bring along in an end to well with, with them and him. If you can remember, Lloyd Sano only played one season and he brought them in and left. So that alone tells you that, you know, something of the mix wasn't right. But at the end of the day, you know, a person comes in the building and, and they tend to see um, or think that they need to make certain changes so that it could be their squad and whatever the case is. But for me, I was just, um, like I said, buzzing at the point that I had the interest because that's the second time I had interest from Liverpool and I was about to go. And it didn't happen just because of, an, I, I think, a bit of spite from him. He, then he, they sort of fashioned me going to Stoke after that. There's no way that you could go from, you know, being able to go to Liverpool to then just drop in at Stoke just like that, you know what I mean? But at that point, me making that decision at that point was just to, to get away from the environment as well because I, I, I honestly didn't want to be at the club with him there. And I think Bruce had been there. You'd been with him six months to a year, if my if my mind is correct. Yeah. I think you played a season with him. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it it you it you led probably, you know, one of the best partnerships between myself and Brent. But then at the end of the day, the next, I think Brent lasted what one more season? Six months. Or six months, and then he sold him. You know what I mean? So it could, because it wasn't. It wasn't happening the way it was, unfortunately. And it, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of reasons for that, but he, I, I, I don't know. I, in my view, I wouldn't recommend him to anyone. <laughs> you talked about a partnership there with Darren Bent. Before I go on to that one, uh, one of my favorite characters and, and probably players um, throughout my time at Sunderland was Jibo Sise. Now, it took a little while for you to get on the pitch together, but when you did, I remember the celebration. You seemed to get on really well. Um, what type of character was Jibo, and, and how did you get on with him? Well, I'd say he's eccentric. Also, well, that was the season that I was out with my uh, knee injury as well, so it took me some time to get back out. And, you know, um, we had a lot of similar interests, and plus um, his, his wife is from Trinidad as well, you know, so that kind of served as another pillar in, in, in us building, you know, a relationship. I mean, to be honest with you, I think it's probably like I last spoke to him about two weeks ago, to be honest. And, you know, it, being able to come out on the pitch at that time was was what well, was good because when you think of someone of, of his caliber at the club that he's played for and the things he's won, to be able for him to come to Sunderland and you know, the, the, the squad, um, you know, having a buzz around it was something pretty fantastic. But then again, like I say, even with the entire mix, um, if Roy had a better backroom staff that was able to, to give him more experience, you know, in, 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 in his journey, I think we'd have turned out a bit better. And then also... At the point in time, in, in, in young men building characters, I don't think a lot of people, you know, viewed a lot of the things that, 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 that Roy said as, you know, just something in the moment. You know, they, they, those were things that they took home with them as well. And that's, it, it's, it, it wasn't right to do that, but then we're still dealing with human beings. You know, people, um, they, 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 they unravel stuff in their own way. They hold on to what they want to hold on to. And, and, and we're still human. We're still human. You know, regardless of how people look at us as, as professionals, living the dream, playing the sport, um, that is our nine to five. And all the stresses that you have in your nine to five 
we have them there too, but it's magnified because we're in a public office. So where where our job is to to play in front of people and we get scrutinized. Whereas, you know, you'll have to come home and tell your family about your, your day at work and, and the problems that you're having, but it's there for the entire world to see our jobs. So, you know, it's 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 difficult. I think, you know, it's 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 a part of life, but what can you do? It's the, it's the profession we chose. Yeah, it's the pros and the cons, I think, because that's how you would maybe describe it. Um, talking about your partnership with Jibo, um, I remember the first game that you played together, and it was for sort of 20 minutes. Now, someone, I'll be honest, someone rejigged my memory here the other day when I was asking for memories about yourself, and it was, you came back from your injury, and the game that you came back in was the, the Newcastle game when we won 2-1. Now, that day was great. Like, one of my better memories from, you know, mm-hmm playing them lot um when i remember when you stepped off the bench and someone reminded me of this the roar was like electric now i think you touched on before about people being humans i think people would forget you probably sat on a treatment table for six to seven months working hard to get back so how does that feel when you hear that it was ridiculous you know there were times that that i was in, i was in so much solitude right in in during that period and I think it was just amazing. You know, the week leading up to me actually training with the squad was, it was scary because again, it was wet. Um, went out in, on the training pitch and I had a slip in a really awkward position as well too. You know, just coming back from the injury. And to be honest with you, it, 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 was, it was an incident that could have caused me to, to be back out for the rest of the season, to be honest. So I had to take it easy from then because I was just thinking, you know, I'm just going to come back out and I'm going to get back to my old self. But from that moment in training, I realized that, you know what, I have to have a lot more thought in everything that I do um, from, from that point on. So when I came back out in the game, again, still being new to training myself or my mind like that, you know, um, I came off the bench and the roar was amazing. And that that uh, is a moment that I'll never forget. Uh, and I came on and because uh, as well is the derby, um, we're trying to win the game. And I can remember me going into this tackle. And I think everybody on the bench probably cringed. Because you wouldn't expect, you know, coming off from an injury like that, you'll get straight back into action and put yourself in a tackle like that. And, you know, the tackle didn't feel wrong. I mean, it was a good tackle. But after coming off a, an ACL injury, you don't want to be a part of that so soon, you know? But to me, it felt it felt right because of the spirit of the game or the nature of the game, really. We're playing Newcastle and then we're trying to win. And then I'm trying to, to get myself back out in, on, on, on that stage to be playing again. But like I said, it took me at least a year after that to actually feel like myself in a lot of respects. Within that year that happened, obviously, uh, Ricky Zabrasia came in towards the end of that season. Well, took over, shall we say. Um, but Roy Keane was the first that brought you in. I think from the outside looking in, and we spoke about it, you had a good relationship. After that game, for some reason, things just fell off a cliff. I think the Blackburn game you mentioned before was like the only game we won, and it went down this weird, horrendous run that came out of nowhere, and then Roy left. Um, how did you well, feel when Roy it's left? Not, it's, it's not weird, because I understand that we're in a business that, that, that requires results. You want to stay in the league. You want to make sure things are right. But a lot of reports as well was going back to the chairman and people at the club that, you know, or he's acting this way and he's saying this type of stuff. Um, and a lot of players were in their feelings, like I said. A lot of, of the things that you say on the training pitch or at the game or after the game in the dressing room is stuff for you to leave there. You know, and a lot of people, they, they, they have different personalities and they were sensitive. So a lot of the things they used to, 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 to take on board with them and take it home and never drop it, you know. So... When you, as a, as a human being, when you hold on to them type of emotions, you sort of need a lot of validation from, from, from the person who is the head of the charge in order for you to go out and perform at your best. 
So the squad emotionally, I think, was um, at, at sorts because, you know, some people will be feeling all right. Others are unsure of themselves because you're not getting a good review. Um, things are being said that people think that shouldn't be said in football. I mean, it's nothing that, you know. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> to be honest with you, uh, all these times, all of these things being said, I, I, I think that was my best period because not laughing at, at, at the players themselves, but some of the things that <laughs> he would say, I swear to you, me and, and, and Carlos and, and Dwight <laughs> and a couple others, you know, for hours. And those are some of the things that we go back on as well. Some of the things that he would have said during sometimes those, those hour long, hour long um, dress downs after games, like some of the things he would say, we would laugh like, like seriously, how could you? And maybe, maybe for us, it was funny because part of our culture, you know, sometimes to come up with some of the wildest things to see in, in, in moments like that, it kind of reminded us of our culture. So it's something, a lot of the things we used to have a laugh about. It was, it, to me, it was, it was one of my, honestly, it was one of my best times. Really one of my best times. With, with Roy, I know you might not be able to, but there's anything that you can repeat that he said that made you laugh in particular? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I mean one one I mean I mean one one time right I, I remember we had um a training session and that day we were playing eleven to eleven and he came out and sat on one of the little hills and was watching the game while we were playing. And then after the game, I mean training went well. After the game we were walking down. And he was walking beside me and he was like, I think that time he had, um, he had a Mercedes S500, right? And I think a couple players come in with a Bentley. Um, another player came in with a Aston Martin. And he woke up beside me. We were walking back into change rooms. <laughs> and he woke up beside me and he was like, Kenwin, I, look, 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 look at these guys. They're coming in here with Bentleys, Aston Martins. Who the, they think they are? I'm, I'm, I'm Roy Keane. And I swear, the next day, he came with an Aston Martin. <laughs> it was so funny to me that, you know, even on that level, he's thinking like, ah, oh, they can be out doing me type of stuff. But it's not something that he expressed to the to the wider group. Me and him was just having a walk and he expressed that to me and I found it so funny. But to be honest, I like that type of stuff because at the end of the day, I, I view him as the person that you would want to, if your temperament is right, I think he's a person that you would want to go to battle for every single time because he's, he's the person that I think would, yes, he would call you out on, on whatever shortcomings you have when you're not performing, but I also think he's the person that will defend you against the entire world, you know? And, but at the same time, like I say, people's perception on some of the things that he was said and how they would receive it and how they would carry that on, um, that, that, that is what destroyed, I think, the mentality or the, or the group emotionally and, and had people in different spaces, you know? But it, like I, I keep saying, like, for me, my perception is different, and I really, really enjoyed his, his tenure at the club. I don't want to um, pinpoint any names here, but I suppose I'm probably going to by proxy anyway. But one of the big mistakes that some people have seen was the players you brought in that summer um, were obviously really talented players, but totally different in personality, i.e. El Hajduf, Pascal Chimbonda, um, off the top of my head. They didn't work out. They were gone within six months. Was it those type of personalities that did, just didn't connect with Roy and didn't understand it? Well, again, he was, I still think at that level, he was new to management and the different pathways he would have to navigate. Um, he didn't have that experience. 
because he came from being a player where, you know, he would G everybody up. He will lead by example, but he's not, he wasn't playing anymore at that time. Right. And bringing in the bodies that he did, it was meant to be seen as a progression for the club for getting, you know, seasoned um, professionals that played in the Premier League for so many years. And it was of the view that it would kind of stabilize the club in the division and we would be a little bit more sturdy and, you know, um, pick up more points and that type of stuff. But I think his experience in dealing with players and uh, different types of personalities or extreme personalities like that at, at, at the managerial level was something probably difficult for him that he couldn't get right. And he didn't have the, the proper backup, I think, from his, his staff in being able to deal with it. Because he had, I think, was Tony Lockwood as the assistant manager, but Tony Lockwood came from coaching like Leicester under 15s or something like that. And then, you know, all of a sudden he's in that, in that, in that, in that big position. And that's something, again, it takes experience over some time to be in that, in that, in that, in, in those types of positions to be able to manage squads. And it, it didn't really work out because they were personalities that, you know, would probably at some point in time toss it off when they feel like, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not being adhered to in a lot of respects and not, and not given the, the treatment that they would like to have. But so he, he, I don't think he could have dealt with that. And that kind of filtered through the squad. I think that's where a lot of those dress downs came from. <laughs> and, and that caused, you know, so many, so many fractions within the squad. But I don't know, maybe, maybe in the future, if he does decide to go back into managing, maybe he'll be able to get the mix right. But he's been out for a little bit, so I don't know. I would pay to see El Hajji versus Roy Keane. I'd, I'd pay lots of money uh, for that. that, 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 that you, you don't want to see that. You don't want to see that. That would be an absolute waste of time. Because I don't think um, El Hajji will be able to, 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 to stand up to that type of challenge. Um, Obviously, we've got about five minutes left, so I've, I've gone off my timeline. That's fine. Um, there was a couple of questions I did want to ask. The first one, spoke about how you potentially went to Liverpool, but the one that really sticks in my mind was after you came back from the injury and went on a ridiculous run of form. Um, I think when Sabrasia was there, he'd been scoring, geez, I think seven, eight goals in a row. Tottenham mm-hmm. come in, 20 million bid. We reject it. You sign a new contract. It was it wasn't it wasn't rejected, you know, funny enough, you know. And those and that and that is, is one of those times where, you know, that that I was getting the experience of football business. Um at that time came back out Frazier. I think we went we went we went um to Seville uh, uh during January to have a little training camp and we had some fun we kind of bonded as a squad uh on the Sprecia because he himself as he would admit all the time he was just doing the job till the end and he didn't really want the job because he's not the the managerial type you know he yeah he, I don't think he could have taken that type of pressure and came back when again as you said went on a little run scored some goals and Tottenham came in it was a funny situation because Harry Redknapp was the manager of Tottenham. I had him for a little bit at Southampton and me and him didn't have a good relationship as well because as everyone knows, Harry Redknapp never liked playing young players. He never liked young players. All his squads were mature players and you know who've had experience this, that, or that. And me and him fell out when... Um, we um, Trinidad and Tobago qualified for the World Cup. I can remember coming back from that. And, you know, everyone was, you know, showing a little praises, giving me um, congratulations and all of that. And he said nothing. And then he tried to, to, to you know, sort of, of come down on me in a lot of ways. And I was like, you know what? I can't be asked with, 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 what you're doing right now, I don't care. And 
I can remember him calling me in his office and saying, you know, who do you think you are? You'll, you'll end up playing for Torquay United. Uh, and, I, and I said to him at that time, I don't know who you think you are. You're not Sir Alex Ferguson. And then that was, that was it. You know, the meeting was over at that time. I was being a little bit, a little bit, you know, boyish because, listen, I just created history. I went to the World Cup for the first time with my country. I am 21 years old. You know, like, come on at least show a little bit of support. And I think during the season with Southampton as well, they, again, they had to shift all the experienced players. So that's where like teammates, the Dannys, the um, Crouch, his son, Jamie Redknapp and all of that, I was teammates with them at that point. So you have to, he had to shift them and then play the, the young players, myself, Dexter Blackstock, Liam Best, um, Nathan Dyer, Theo Walcott. And we were doing pretty well. Um, but before he shifted the players, you know, every time that I would play, I would either contribute a goal or a couple of assists because he would only bring me on for like 15 minutes, 10 minutes, that type of thing. And I'd always contribute. And I remember the last straw, we were away at Leeds in the champ. And I think we drew... We drew to all or something and we had the opportunity to win because I came on in the last 15 minutes and I basically had should have had three assists during that 15 minute period but when the game was over you know I, I walked off the field because I'm like you know we're losing the game and you're refusing to like make changes bring on players so that we could you know try and at least win the game and I walked as soon as we lost um, um, Drew, game was finished. I walked off the field. He, he walked in pretty quickly behind me in the dressing room and he started to say some horrible stuff. And me and him fell out at that point. And then pretty much, because I think he was under pressure from the, the chairman and stuff to play young players and he didn't want to at that time. And then a, a couple of days after, he was caught going over the back fence of Southampton to go back to Portsmouth. But lo and behold, he got to Tottenham and, and this is the part that, that I don't like about the whole scenario. He got to Tottenham and that January came around doing well. He called up the club. I spoke with um, the chairman at that time, Mr. Quinn. Spoke to him one day. He said there's interest, blah, blah, blah. I was like, listen, I'm concentrating on football. But when they actually start talking about the money that was supposed to be paid, things got a little bit testy. So I can remember Harry doing everything he could to speak to me because after he left Southampton, went back to Portsmouth, any team that I played for, he never beat me. I made sure that, you know what, they would suffer every single time. And I can remember him having loads of people ring me up, text me. Uh, that, um, I can remember him having Jamie, you know, call me. Uh, dad wants to speak to you, you know, he really wants you to come down to Tottenham. I was like, that. I was like, listen, at this point in time in my life, I have grown up from that, from, 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 from that period. You know, I have no problem going there and working with him because it's, it's no big issue to me. And then I can remember him calling me. And the first thing he did was apologize. But by that time, which again, it, it kind of pissed me off. I think he did his book before that and he put me in his book stating some stuff i'm like why didn't you put in your book that you apologized you know just because you want me to come to tottenham you're like you know let bygones be bygones and whatever you know what i did at that time it was wrong and and i was like you know i could appreciate that because at the end of the day when you have a young player you have to know how to treat with a young player to get the best out of them but i don't think he he, he knew how to do that too well at the point or maybe he, he succumbed to pressure. So after I spoke with him, I was like, you know what? I called up Niall Quinn and I was like, listen, I know that there's interest and they've made a bid and it's on the table because they were willing to take the money. There was no doubt about it. They were willing to take the money. It wasn't a situation where they were saying, nah, we're not going to take the money. We're trying to, you know, stay in the division and all of that. They were willing to take the 20 million. And... He said to me, you know, I can't give you permission to speak to them. 
But if you want to speak to them under the table, you can do that. And I was like, why would I do that? Because then that's going to land me in a lot of trouble. It probably land Tottenham in a, in, a, in a lot of trouble. But I guess it's to shape the narrative that, you know, oh, we didn't want to sell him. He wanted to go type of thing so that they would always look good. But those are a lot of the things that people don't know about when it comes to, to situations like that. They were already ready to take the money and go. And then in the end, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that. And then they turned around and offered me a, 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 a new contract and, and I signed because, again, I, Sunderland is, is a club that I love. One last question, I suppose, and it's probably a little bit off topic because um, I could I could speak for ages here. This would be great. Um, but you played in a really talented Sunderland team. Um, like when I think about the time, I think about the players that we had and Darren Bent is the first one that comes to mind because of the partnership that you had. But you played with them, you trained with them every day. Who was the best player you played with at Sunderland? Steve Barbrown. I'll say that without a doubt. Uh, I think people, um, you know, are not conscious of how good he was as a footballer, as a creative mind. And I think a lot of players at the club at that time, while he was there, wasn't really in tune with his level and the way he would think. And sometimes, you know, maybe with his personality and attitude, because literally, you know, if you, if you go day by day in a week, Steed would have probably said five words, literally. You know, he'd come out, he'd play, he'd train. He might make some noise when he wants you to pass the ball. But in speaking words, he would literally, a week, the most you're going to get out of him is five. And he never used to really, like, hang with the squad too much or, or you know, have conversations with people that, I mean, obviously that doesn't speak French, that type of thing. So it was it was really hard for people to endear themselves to him. Yeah. But on the football pitch, he was amazing and used to see it every day in training. Um, I think maybe he used to get frustrated because he would have probably think that, you know, yeah, maybe he should have been in a, 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 a better club with high quality players, you know, that probably would have uh, lifted his mood a little bit. But he was he was absolutely amazing. Uh, I was thankful to play with him and, and to benefit, you know, from a lot of his, of his skill and, and exploits on the pitch. Yeah, tremendous player. Love Steve Marbon. But Kenwin, thanks so much for your time. Um, it's been great catching up, great going over some nice memories, truth be told, and nice to hear kind of the inside story of what happened with yourself at Sunderland. But I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah, I do. I do. Maybe we could do this some other time. I yeah, why not? Yeah, I could I could speak for days, so I'm happy to do that. But <laughs> Kenwin, I'll let you get on. Thanks so much for, for taking the time out to speak to me and um good luck with everything you're doing at the moment. My pleasure. My absolute pleasure.